Good uh, morning, everybody. My name is um, Alex Friedland. Uh, I'm uh, co-founder of uh, Mirantis. Uh, it's my second time I'm talking to this uh, audience, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, today, I wanted to speak to you about um, the OpenStack co-petition, uh, kind of the view from within. There is a lot of uh, discussions that we hear about, you know, on the marketing side about, you know, how this works, but uh, uh, we are one of the co-founders of the foundation. We've been in OpenStack since day one, and there is, you know, kind of a different picture from, you know, when you look at it from inside out as opposed to from outside in. And so this is really what this talk is about. Um, um, but before I go into the competition, I mean, what is it that we're fighting for? I mean, the other day, uh, I've been fortunate enough to discuss OpenStack with uh, Mark Andreessen, who is, um, as we all know, he's uh, head of, um, founder of Andreessen Horowitz, and uh, the guy who uh, started the internet with Netscape browser, and, uh, you know, on the board of um, um, Facebook and uh, HP and uh, I think eBay. And so um, he's been very vocal saying that, hey, you know, uh, Amazon pretty much won the game of the clouds. And we said, but, but what about OpenStack? And he kind of sat there and said, well, OpenStack, it looks like it's the beginning of the new industry. Now, why is it the beginning of the new industry? I mean, what is it that we're fighting for? And uh, uh, it kind of feels to us here is that we're in the early days of uh, the new retooling, right? And you remember when IBM came up with the IBM PC and Microsoft came with the new operating system. That kind of feels like this day that OpenStack has a semblance of being the new operating system for the cloud and cloud is going to be this brand new ecosystem. So, uh, but what's important here is the word open. And um, what I have here on the, on the, um, screen is you have um, a whole bunch of innovation components in the infrastructure and those could be infrastructure you know could be load balancers could be um, you know networking components and compute components and any innovation right that is sort of spread out like this and there are two ways to deliver it to to the customers one is completely open innovation of those components that are completely haphazard and the other is very much proprietary set of components that are opinionated by somebody else. So Amazon actually takes this approach. VMware, if they were to you know, be looked at, would be taking this approach. They'll tell you what is it that they support. And they need, you need their agreement to actually support that. And why is this important? Because when you look at the financial metrics of what it takes to actually adopt this infrastructure, the traditional way it's happening today is you know, a CIO would make a three-year commitment to a certain technology. In there, they'll make commitments, you know, over a period of time, how much storage they buy and how much the storage is, and they'll actually settle on a specific vendor. And in a proprietary quarterly spend, every quarter they'll spend, I don't know, $500 million or whatever the number to buy that. Now, what happens when you have open innovation, you don't have to ask anybody's permission to innovate. It becomes part of the stack. You can actually rethink it every quarter and every quarter, the amount of money you will have to spend to get the same capacity and infrastructure is going to be less. And you will see the exponential cost disruption in the infrastructure. And when you kind of scale it to the industry, what you can see is that um, we'll be able to, you know, with this open approach, we'll be able to actually get you know, a level playing field between the Googles of this world and companies like let's say I'm making this up here, but you know, Johnson & Johnson or Procter & Gamble that want to actually build personalized medicine or personalized medical products or personalized nutrition products to every citizen of the earth, you have to actually build the infrastructure that is similar to what Google is building and they don't have the promise that Google has to build infrastructure, so they need to have a level playing field cost-wise and this is actually a candidate to be that. So that's the battle that we're fighting. And if we can win it in an open fashion, this is going to be the new tomorrow, right? So that's, that's why it's so important. But, uh, um, but so let's see how this battle is being fought, who the players are, and how does it look from within. So first of all, in open source, um, what we're seeing here is co-petition. How many of you know what co-petition is? Uh, a number of you. So here's a definition of competition from Wikipedia. So competition takes place when companies that are in the same market work together in the exploration of knowledge and research of new products and at the same time they compete for market share of those products and exploitation of the knowledge created. So clearly 
in the OpenStack arena, uh, there is all of us working together, and yet all of us are competing for influence, for market share, and for our ideas to be the dominant ideas of, you know, what's going to create this new industry. So here is how it, you know, OpenStack looks from the outside. You know, and this is actually Jonathan Bryce. Uh, um, from the inside, the picture is somewhat different. Um, it's actually, uh, there is quite a bit of battles going on. Some of those battles are technology battles where you're trying to get the new technology working in production and that sometimes is a challenge, although it's getting easier and easier. And sometimes these are, you know, vendors trying to kind of, you know, position themselves in the best light to be able to actually scale in this industry. So, uh, in this talk, I'll talk about essentially the territories that are being conquered, weapons being used, and the key battles being fought. Um, the first is the territories. So um, we're going to start here by defining what's called an OpenStack treasure island, and uh, we'll call it an OpenStack distro. It remains to be seen if this is actually the treasure island, because it's very possible that this, is, this might not be the way this industry is going to be developing, but let's assume for a second that this is kind of the coveted space. And uh, nobody really knows what it is, and, but there are different beachheads of how you attack this island. So the first would be the services beachhead, and I'll explain uh, why in a second. The second is a training beachhead. The next one is upstream influence beachhead. And then the OpenStack product islands, which is uh, you use, you use uh, OpenStack as, as the foundation and you actually build productized solutions on top of it that customers will consume. So nobody really knows what it is, but now for the first time, the analysts are starting to do projections as, as to what the size of the market is. And uh, um, I believe 451 Group just came up with a report that um, suggested that in 2013, the treasure island for distro is about $52 million and in, um, uh, per year, and in the next year, it's gonna be something in the neighborhood of 82 million. And uh, around this, in the, on the products, you know, the, uh, this past year was 31 million versus 49 next year. So it's starting to grow. Uh, now, these numbers, I mean, the, the, way, the way they're done, they're, you know, bottoms-up approach, and we participated in this survey, and as, long, you know, as well as many, many other uh, vendors. So I actually think these numbers are somewhat tracking. Um, um, so this is, this is the very, very early days. But um, let's talk about each of the beachheads and discuss why it makes sense to actually attack it. So the first beachhead to attack the island is services. Now, why services? Services is because it's really uh, easy to attack. Uh, the barrier to entry is really, really small. You know, you need a couple of you know, smart people who know OpenStack and they can go in. Uh, this is where the um, early OpenStack market is. Um, 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 if you look at who are the people who are adopting uh, OpenStack traditionally, at first those were infrastructure vendors, then service providers and internet application vendors, you know, people like PayPal and, you know, LivePerson and the like, and then enterprises where the most amount of money is today, they're in the third phase. So the first people who are adopting, you know, early adopter in the um, OpenStack world are, um, people who are mostly the do-it-yourself type vendors. They have a lot of technology, uh, acumen and expertise inside, and they are not looking to buy somebody's opinionated solution. What they're looking to buy is expertise, and they build a lot of it themselves. So the early days of market like OpenStack is dominated by um, services. And so, um, you know, if you, if, you, if you win this beachhead, what happens is you really get close to early adopters. You are able to define usage patterns of how OpenStack is actually being used. Um, and you, you, know, you get paid to learn, which is you know, not, not, not something to be dismissed. And you build reputation and get a lot of logos. So when you look at beachhead uh, training, I mean, I'm sorry, services, and see who is there, well, the sort of the largest and the most known player in the services space is actually Mirantis. We chose that um, as a way to attack it. Um, we have, um, um, you know, about 70 customers today that we've, um, you know, been able to implement using uh, services. Some of the big names like PayPal and WebEx and Gap all came through the services engagement. You know, the latest big one is Semantic that's going all out that we just won. Um, 
So um, this is kind of probably the beachhead that we control. Uh, now, the people who are attacking it is uh, Rackspace. Uh, they were the first ones to introduce uh, OpenStack um, early on in a public cloud setting, but now, and you know, for a while now, they've been claiming to have, uh, uh, in addition to the managed services business, the pure services. And you know, we actually know a couple of customers. They're helping uh, GE, uh, Sony Entertainment, uh, a few other customers that they have under their name. Uh, Ubuntu. Uh, Ubuntu, that's been actually very popular um, you know, for OpenStack early on. They do offer services. And of course, Red Hat is starting to uh, go you know, all out on services as a way to deliver uh, their opinionated stack because uh, Red Hat, of course, is tied to, uh, to the RHEL stack. Uh, so this is, you know, so I believe we control this uh, beachhead today, but it's being attacked. I mean, there are other players as well. I mean, Innovance is making uh, some serious advances also in this. Uh, they don't have a services. Well, I'll, they'll be here, but not in the services beachhead. All right, so next is uh, training. Now, training is a very, very, very important beachhead. Why? Well, first of all, uh, it's, it's an easy one. The barrier to entry is very small. Uh, demand is high, so it's easy to um, attack. The quality is the only thing you can do to protect it. Uh, it will commoditize very quickly. It's important because uh, tra training is something that people usually buy to get familiar with OpenStack or any new technology for that matter. So if you associate your brand with teaching people how to use OpenStack, uh, you can indoctrinate ecosystem with your opinion. Uh, the, every student that you teach becomes an advocate for your technology or for your brand and you know, potentially later product. Uh, dominating training was something that allowed Red Hat in the early days to actually claim victory in the Linux world. Uh, and if you look today in other competing open source ecosystems, you will see that Cloudera, for example, which is a leading uh, Hadoop vendor, is actually number one in training. And most of their uh, training is used as a beachhead to actually sell um, you know, many of Cloudera Hadoop distributions. So who is attacking um, training beachhead today? Uh, Rackspace was kind of the first there, but since that time, I believe Mirantis is again uh, probably the leading uh, training uh, company today. Um, we've trained this year probably 25, 2700 people. We're doing, I don't know, eight to 10 public uh, courses a month in eight to 10 geographies plus numerous uh, private trainings. So this is something that we've been able to scale again because it's very similar to uh, the services play. But again, there is a huge, huge battle already brewing there. Red Hat understands the importance of uh, training, and they have tremendous training organization reputation in the marketplace. So they're pounding uh, really hard uh, onto this. They uh, launched uh, certification, uh, Red Hat certification. Um, the, uh, of course, the difference here is that Red Hat uh, they're training everything, again, on their opinionated stack. So everything includes their, uh, well, not, you know, their, their opinion on how OpenStack should be. So it's ROS, it's RHEL, it's the, the full um, Red Hat stack. Now, other people now are actually strong into this. Um, uh, so uh, the foundation, as we all know, have launched a training marketplace because they're trying to actually level the playing field and make sure that everybody has a chance to play. So through that, you know, people like uh, Hastexo right here, you know, will have a training um, and, you know, many more that we, you know, that uh, Florian and his company is doing. Uh, there is, you know, Piston is running it, Aptiri is actually running it in uh, Australia. Um, you know, Piston has a program. Um, quite a number of, uh, of people are, are launching their training. So this is going to be a heavily contested, very crowded space. Uh, another one that kind of is obvious to us, but uh, to my surprise, not a lot of uh, people understand the importance of is uh, upstream influence. So why is it important to kind of control the upstream? Um, in, in open source, um, um, you know, code is, is, is power, right? So whoever is the code has, a, you know, the best reputation and also ability to innovate faster, control the roadmap, and uh, being the source of source code matters. Uh, so 
the people who are able to control this will have a lot of influence and will probably be chosen first to become the go-to players for somebody who wants to have commercial explo exploitation of OpenStack. So if you look historically again, um, um, uh, so here is, here is a table of who uh, controls you know, the, the, the largest number of uh, code commits in, um, in Linux, and you can see that Red Hat is you know, by far uh, number one, you know, followed by Intel, but uh, Red Hat is actually huge, and so Red Hat is the largest uh, Linux vendor out there. The other, you know, Suzy is right there, and you know, Intel has a you know, huge uh, uh, Linux team as well. So these are the people who are you know, known to be strong li uh, Linux players, and they're all huge uh, upstream influence people. Likewise, if you look at uh, the Hadoop ecosystem, which uh, is another very large um, you know, big data ecosystem that is actually a couple, three years ahead as an open source community compared to open, uh, OpenStack, we see that uh, the most prominent vendor, which is Cloudera, is number one. And the second, now competing for first prominent, in prominence, Hortonworks, and Yahoo is actually the same thing because Hortonworks is a spin out out of Yahoo. They're, they combined have close to 25% of all the upstream influence. So this is, again, shows you that the most prominent vendors really um, fight for control of this beachhead. So um, now, why again, just to repeat, you know, in OpenStack, people who have control over this, this beachhead, they shape OpenStack roadmap, build better products uh, by leveraging community knowledge. Uh, they can able, you know, they're able to merge patches and fixes quicker. And of course, uh, providing customer advocacy upstream, this is very important. I mean, we, 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 we see it every day. We work with customers who are not interested to see their particular technology being forked somewhere. They want to see how to get it upstream as much as possible, and also they're asking for opinion as to which way to, act, to go to make sure that their, their particular roadmap is supported upstream. And of course, the company that has more influence upstream will be a much better partner in, in that adoption. Um, so, um, now let's take a little detour and talk about in OpenStack, what are the best way to kind of monetize open source. Um, there, are, there are sort of two ways to monetize open source in general. One is uh, just take it as is, open source as is, and try to monetize it through subscription and support, and the other is do what's called an open core, where you have the open source thing in the middle, and then you try to build proprietary components or packaging outside of it, and that's what you sell, and that's called an open core model. Now, uh, the jury is still out which way OpenStack is gonna develop, but we certainly are of the opinion that open core is not something that will um, work in OpenStack. In a, in a way, because you know, we see that OpenStack really, you know, it's kind of eats its own children. It doesn't have really a core. And let's kind of look historically in the last three years of how OpenStack developed and see what I mean by that. So originally when um, OpenStack was first um, 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 introduced, you know, the, uh, the core was defined as Nova, Cinder, uh, Quantum, Glance, and Horizon. And then people looked at this as great, this is just basic infrastructure as a service. There is good value add ways to, um, to, to monetize that. So clearly if you need that, you need to have billing solutions, you need to have metering solutions, and proprietary vendors came out, people like Grantsoft, um, intelligent on billing and metering, and uh, just as they became comfortable, Silometer was introduced and was accepted into the core, and really now all those guys are not that relevant anymore. So looking at that, the next thing that happened, there are other value add pieces that uh, happen to emerge. You know, if you need to build um, you know, this ecosystem, then you have to have deployment and configuration management and orchestration tools and vendors like Puppet and Chef and uh, uh, SaltStack you know, came about. And then you know, OpenStack introduced Heat. That is, as it becomes more and more mature, you know, the uh, puppet and chef is less and less required to actually run OpenStack. And in fact, uh, if you want to be inside of OpenStack, as we, as, we, as we are learning, you cannot have all those pieces. You need to have an alternative. Uh, so uh, again, the 
added value of those components inside the eco uh, OpenStack ecosystem is now being destroyed. Let's keep going. So deployment and management. Uh, vendors came out and understand that OpenStack is, you know, it's hard to deploy and needs to be managed. And so a lot of proprietary tools started to get developed. Tools like Crowbar and Juju and uh, not so proprietary uh, open source, but still developed by us. Fuel, Stack Ops, you know, came about and boom, Triple O and Tascar. <laughs> Monty is right here, right? So uh, that appears and all those other tools, you know, unless they add value add and can quickly become part of the greater Triple O and Tascar, uh, um, you know, the, the value of those tools in the ecosystem is going to be diminished. So uh, this is essentially an example, you know, so today, I mean, um, there, was, there was, you know, those of you who, uh, who are reading um, blogs around OpenStack and those of us are, who are uh, following, you know, news on Twitter saw that there was a huge uh, controversy that actually blew up against, uh, around a blog that I issued completely unbeknownst um, that I said that uh, because OpenStack is a full stack that will, you know, once it controls the infrastructure level layer, it starts to move up the stack. You know, people like uh, Cloud Foundry in the past, uh, you know, Cloud Foundry, Dot Cloud, uh, um, you know, OpenShift are potentially toast and, we, you know, caused tremendous controversy. You know, Cloud Foundry people got really, really up in arms and uh, a few others as well. And uh, just as, uh, as we were beaten up, totally unbeknownst to us, oops, a project Solum appeared um, as part of OpenStack, which is essentially a pass, a native pass um, on top of OpenStack that is actually spearheaded, among other things, and you know, other people by the CloudShift uh, Red Hat guys. So, um, uh, so, sure. So, why are we adding Mistral and uh, tools like that? So, uh, uh, we are actually planning to have Mistral and Murano and all others become part of the, you know, the greater OpenStack ecosystem. It's just the way it happens is we introduce it on StackForge with the community effort. We build community around it, and as it gets traction and integrates with other projects, it will become part of, um, of OpenStack. That's how you innovate. You innovate by creating a vision, by sharing a vision, building community around it, and then it being accepted. So this is a lead in to what I'm trying to say. So what is the takeaway? Don't waste time building proprietary islands. This is the answer to your question. Join the party and build everything upstream. So Mirantis, for example, we don't do any development anywhere other than in StackForge. And everything we do is open source. And immediately we announce it to the whole world. And we try to build community around it and integrate with as many pieces inside OpenStack as possible. We believe that this is the only way to be relevant and uh, trying to, you know, to build things outside that will hold value. I mean, if you're, if you're a different ecosystem, for example, if you're a Hadoop, and uh, you know, I don't think Hadoop itself will get eaten by OpenStack, but you know, we introduced Savannah, which is the control plane for Hadoop on top of OpenStack, and that is something that is now part of OpenStack. So, and it was introduced with the community and inside the community. I saw a hand, yes. You mean for the business model? Yeah. For monetization? Yeah. Right, there'll be a panel to follow, we'll, we'll answer that. So, um, all right, so, so that's the takeaway. Do not build anything proprietary if you want to be part of the greater OpenStack ecosystem. Now again, this is our opinion. We don't, we don't pretend like we know everything, but certainly this is the model that we've adopted. And so far the history seems to be moving that way. So let's look at upstream influence and see who is actually f uh, fighting this battle and uh, why this, you know. So today, the people who are the most, you know, the strongest and the most influential committers in the upstream influence is uh, Red Hat. They came a little bit later. They started in Folsom. Uh, they started in, you know, in, um, before Folsom, but in Folsom they became number one top committer 
and they're only increasing their leadership. I mean, they really know how to work, you know, how to work things upstream. They're really good. Um, their engineers are extremely strong, and they execute really, really well. So, uh, traditionally, Rackspace was, you know, the biggest contributor. But um, you know, as um, as things are moving, we see them uh, actually displaced from number one in Essex uh, to number three in Havana. So they're slowly losing ground. Uh, Mirantis, um, we started kind of late, and we were number 16 in Grizzly. Uh, we're gaining ground steadily, and hopefully we'll continue to do so. We're number five committer in Havana, so we're an up. HP has been a huge um, influencer in um, uh, upstream community, uh, holding the ground steady, uh, the number four since Essex. IBM uh, moved from number six to number two in Havana, and they're gaining, they're gaining. So they're, you know, like a big tanker steamship. They're just, you know, adding power and going very, very steady. Um, in Avance, it's been um, actually, you know, an inter interesting company. Steadily gaining, Folsom number 11, Grizzly number seven, Havana number six. And we're seeing them adding more and more. Um, so, but there, there are many different ways you can actually look at um, how, um, uh, you know, you, you measure things upstream. So you can actually slice it by different categories. So here is, on the left is information on Havana documentation. You can see that Rackspace is by far um, uh, a number one contributor to, uh, to documentation. There is another way to look at it, and this is what we've been sort of suggesting both at the board level and in the community, that the innovation uh, around OpenStack ecosystem should happen in open source, not necessarily inside the core of OpenStack, but the projects that will be offered. And there is a sandbox, which is StackForge, where all the open source, um, um, OpenStack related development ought to be taking place. And if you look at it from this perspective, uh, in Havana, you can see that Mirantis is like 3x larger than anybody else by uh, line of code, because all the things that we've talked about, you know, Mistral and Murano and, you know, Fuel and Stackalytics, all of it is developed completely open source. And some of it will actually make it into, you know, OpenStack with time. Um, so, um, finally, um, uh, there, are, there are the other islands that we're talking, the value add products, and so that's, that's what people are trying to say. So there is an AWS Fidelity Island, people who are saying that it's very, very important to be compatible with AWS, that's what the market wants. Uh, the other uh, story is uh, a specific enterprise-related story, you know, let's build something that is a replacement for VMware inside, uh, you know, using OpenStack. There is a managed services um, island, Let's uh, sell uh, OpenStack as a managed service as opposed to software. Uh, there is OpenStack Appliance Island, which means let's just you know, give you a box that will run OpenStack, and that's the way to monetize it. And then there is a complementary product island, uh, which is um, uh, yeah, two more minutes, three more minutes. So uh, cloud scaling actually is a big proponent of um, AWS Fidelity. Piston are the guys who do uh, um, OpenStack you know, for enterprise, MetaCloud and Rackspace um, today are in the managed services space. And by the way, this is going to be a very, very crowded island because a lot of, uh, of OpenStack is going to be consumed this way. Nebula and Morph Labs are the people in the uh, appliance space. And uh, uh, InkTech, their uh, Ceph product is probably the number one value added um, um, product that came as a result of OpenStack innovation. So. Uh, this is who controls the beachheads today. So um, I have uh, two or three more slides on kind of the weapons, so I'll just go very quickly on those. So how do people fight those battles? And um, on the marketing and PR side, so Red Hat, uh, their main message is because we own upstream influence, we will become the Linux of OpenStack. Canonical is saying Ubuntu is the number one host OS, uh, our release cycles are aligned, use us. Rackspace said, hey, we're the regional OpenStack people, use us. Mirantis said, we, ha we have the most um, customers and we're the only pure play, we don't want to sell any other products through OpenStack, use us. Cloud Scaling says, if you want to have AWS Fidelity, we're the only ones. Piston says, hey, we use OpenStack and we wear cool hats. Um, IBM and HP, they have a very strong message. We have all the customers, you trusted us for years, and we tell you that OpenStack is here to stay. 
Um, so the marketing messages that we can see, uh, and this is basically from, from, from uh, the company's um, websites, are exemplifying that particular position. So Red Hat is a top code contributor across all OpenStack projects, a platinum member, use us. You know, canonical, do you know that most OpenStack clouds run on Ubuntu? Uh, so uh, marketing for IBM and HP, IBM makes a big bet on OpenStack. HP, we're completely committed to OpenStack. Now, there is an important issue called account control that we all have to understand. And so big guys like Red Hat, HP, and IBM, they have customers and they have relationships in the customers and they use that to convince customers to buy. Uh, you've known us for years and we've always delivered, so buy more from us. Now, what's interesting is, there is, if you use that methodology to gain customers, there's actually, it can backfire on you sometimes. And if you remember the Linux wars, Sun, HP, and IBM used to have that message, and Red Hat was the kind of the new kid in the block. And when the big guys would say, hey, you know, we've always sold you this, the customer would look back at them and say, hey, you know, you sold us X, and now you're using us, you know, in this case, Linux, to sell us more of X. That's not why we're buying Linux. So OpenStack is very similar. You know, if you're trying to use it to sell more of your proprietary products, it's not necessarily what customers want. So uh, the final thing is there are partnerships and the go-to-market plays that, you know, and alliances that people build to actually deal with the account control issues. So we saw that uh, Mark Shuttleworth, for example, invested a uh, million dollars into Ceph. Now, one thing is to say that, hey, he's just a smart entrepreneur, but another way to say is, hey, you know, um, Ubuntu is saying that we have a better storage solution than you Red Hat on Gluster. Uh, Suzy is now doing Hyper-V, and this is a way to say Red Hat and KVM, you know, you know we're stronger than you are. Uh, Plum Grid joins Red Hat OpenStack. This is the way to say, hey, you know, this is against uh, VMware, you know, NYSERA acquisition. There was another one that's not here. VMware announced a partnership with Mirantis OpenStack. Why is that? Well, this is to say, hey, you know, we have control. VMware has strong traction in enterprise. We don't want Red Hat to come take it. So we'll partner with our existing ecosystem and push uh, Mirantis in there. So the final slide is, you know, it's a, big, it's a big game. There's a lot of different things. So how do you kind of st stay true to, you know, to what needs to be done? And I think there are two basic things is, one is be relevant to what customers are really looking for, so create customer value, and then make sure it works well. Because in the end, technology doesn't always win, but we believe it actually works, you know, wins all the time, you know, most of the time, if, if, if your delivery is consistent. So that's, that's my talk. Thank you.